Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you out there in the cyber sanctuary, whenever you may have chosen to watch this online Bible study. Evangelist Matthew Miles Sr. welcoming you to another uh, online class of Living as God's Kingdom Man. This is lesson number 13. We welcome you to a new year. We trust and pray that God will bless you uh, with love, joy, peace, good health, and prosperity in this year. Brothers, I'm encouraging you to let's share this online Bible study. The information we receive on a certain day may not speak to a particular situation that's going on in our life, but it will enhance us and equip us to help others who may be in need of this information. Uh, all of us need some encouraging. All of us need to be challenged to live as God's kingdom man. With that said, let's get right to it. Father God, we thank you for this day. I ask you to bless us now in this study. Defeat us when we're wrong. Help us when we're right. Bless this word that it may permeate the hearts of men everywhere and that a great harvest of obedience will come forward. This is our prayer. We ask in your holy son, Jesus name. Amen. I want to get back to the subject here. We we'll continue to use the book written by Dr. Tony Evans, Kingdom Man, as a guide. Uh, but of course, you know, the word of God has the final word. Uh, we're looking at this part of the book now entitled Looking at the Casualties, Looking at the Casualties. Brother, let's start this lesson by observing this term casualty. A person killed or injured in a war or accident. A person or thing badly affected by an event or a situation. Brothers, living in these days of a certain times, and we can all agree upon this, that life in this world is full of events and people who have caused many casualties for others. It seems that everywhere you look now today, brothers, that uh, people are being hurt and even killed almost everywhere and almost every day. Well, shall I say every day? It appears that there is virtually no 100% place of safety anymore. On the streets, simply driving, minding your own business, suddenly you find yourself a casualty of road rage. All of us have been there. No, you may have not pulled out a gun. Perhaps you just cursed. Or maybe you didn't even curse, but you threw the bird, flipped the bird. You didn't flip the bird. You just got angry. In 2019, 82% of people admitted to uh, in being involved in some kind of form of road rage. They got some kind of <laughs> mad about something. Uh, a total of 12,600 people, uh, 610 to be exact was injured, and uh, 218 people was murdered in a seven-year span in, in the, the United States, all because of road rage. Can you imagine that? On your way to the store, on your way to church, on your way home from work, never thinking you would get into it with anybody and end up dead from road rage? 66% of traffic uh, fatal fatality, 66% of traffic fatality fatalities were due to road rage, not accidents, 66%. Parents send their children to school, never thinking that their baby wouldn't return home from school. I'm a father of five grown children, but I'm a grandfather of 13. And I never want to imagine a phone call that my babies were at school trying to learn or at daycare and become a casualty. You remember the Columbine shooting? We pray for those families today. 15 killed, 24 injured by the very own uh, schoolmate. Your own home is no longer safe. Between 2019 and 2020, 61% of mass shootings took place in the home, in your home. Let's keep it real, brother. How many of us have not only purchased one gun, but several? And have them strategically placed all over our home just in case we're broken in on in a certain area. But brothers, we are no longer safe, not only in our home, but even in the Lord's church, in the worship house. When the deadliest shootings took place in 2017, the First Baptist Sutherland Church in Sutherland Spring in, uh, in Sutherland Church in Texas. 26 dead, including an unborn child. 
Can you imagine sitting in worship, trying to work out your soul salvation, and some strange, deranged person enters in and kills 26 parishioners? My beloved brethren, it is clear that there are casualties all around us. But one of the greatest casualties happens right in our culture. The absence of the male in the home, and particularly the African-American male, particularly the father. The absence of the kingdom men results in many detrimental casualties. The absence of the kingdom man in the home results in the brokenness of the home, results in the decay of the family. The absence of the kingdom man results in the devastation of a community. I remember when I was a young boy in our community, particularly on our block, the older men didn't take no mess. We didn't have problems with gangs in, on our block and in our present community. The absence of the kingdom man results in the breakdown of our nation. The reason we have so much turmoil in Washington, D.C. right now is because of the lack of kingdom men. Dr. Evan declares, and I quote, to say that men have lost their identity is an understatement. He further states, and I thoroughly agree, that casual, and I quote, that casualties abound of men not fulfilling their God-given role to provide leadership and mirror God's character and management. Those are important terms. God's character, leadership, management. The question is, can you, can you recall the very first time we see this very scenario played out in the history of man? Can you recall that? In the precious, blessed Garden of Eden, you remember the story. In the first home of the first family, of the first man, many may uh, agree uh, or argue whether or not Adam was there at the very moment of the conversation between Eve and the serpent. I know many people argue that. Was he right there at that very moment? Or did he come later and partake of the fruit? But I tell you, whether Adam was presently doing the actual conversation or not, we do know without fear of successful contradiction that Adam ate the forbidden fruit, failing to fulfill his God-given role to provide leadership and to mirror God's character and management and protection of his wife and his family. And thus was the very first casualty and most devastating casualty of all humanity, the birthing of sin into this world. Heard a young man speak not long ago, bragging about his fiance and about how uh, she's not behind him, but she's out in front of him, uh, making sure that he doesn't make a fool out of her. And he was proudly promoting that propaganda, which is a direct opposite of God's word. That's what happened to Eve. She got out in front. She got out of place. And I don't mean no harm to my sisters and out there, but God has a divine order. And he has placed man as the head of the home. Paul makes that clear, that Christ, uh, man is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. How foolish this young man could have been. Needless to say, a millennial. Uh, those who think they got it all together think old is outdated. That's most of their mentality. Not all. God has a pattern. And when we disregard that pattern, men, to provide the leadership and the character of God in our home, sin becomes present, prevalent, and will take over until it destroys. Brethren, the next observation we will make from this awesome work of Dr. Evans is the re recollection uh, of very vol volatile home life for uh, for he and his 
his three siblings. In other words, we want to look at Dr. Evans uh, going down memory lane about some events or a particular event that happened in his home. Dr. Evans recalled that from, um, from the earliest he can recall up until the age of 10 years old, his home was filled with the constant conflict of his father and mother that caused nothing but chaos in their home and, of course, in their lives. Dr. Evans very openly admits that because of such turmoil in his home that he himself could not have or could have been a casualty. And brethren, keeping it 100 without caps, that could have been many of us. I thank God I, I was not in that number. But those of you I'm not speaking to, many of you may have experienced the same casualties in your home and in your life. Dr. Evans was the oldest of four children. Can you imagine the extra pressure that was put upon him? Being the oldest trying to keep himself together while trying to comfort his younger siblings. Does that sound familiar to some of us? Brethren, as I was reading and studying from this lesson, my heart became very ha heavy and my eyes instantly filled with tears, not because of any experience of my own, but just because of the very opposite. You see, brothers, I grew up in a home that was a Christian home. And I thank God that I can use the term structured, not necessarily strict, but structured home. What I mean by structured and not strict is, although my father was the late great uh, evangelist Mark Bow Sr., uh, who preached over 50 years, who was a sound, faithful trailblazer, of a true gospel preacher and my mother was truly a faithful kingdom woman of God you see they did not forget that I and uh, my eight living siblings were young human beings in other words they allowed us to be children but children with expectations to be obedient to them and then to God when we grew into the knowledge of God's word. That's the difference between being strict and structured. You can be strict and still not raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. But we was raised in a structured home, structured by the word of God. Men of the King, my father has been sleeping now with the fathers for 24 years, this coming soon. And my dear mother, that great woman of wisdom is 93 years blessed. But my God, bless my father to be in my life for 30 years. And I never witnessed my father or mother causing any chaos in our family. Never witnessed them loud talking one another, let alone cursing each other. Never heard them fighting physically or verbally. Now, of course, they had agreements, disagreements, shall I say. But they discussed it. And they discussed it among themselves like Christians. The biblical principle. You have an ought against someone, you ought to go to them and him alone. They did not make their business our, our business. And God blessed me to take that very same example of fathering into my own family and with my own children because I wanted my children to grow up in the same loving, hugging, kissing, laughing, joyful home that I experienced. Some of the joy you saw between me and my sisters and my sisters and my brothers, it would probably seem strange or over the top for some of you all, but we loved each other dearly did some crazy things together but we loved each other dearly so yes my heart was very heavy reading about dr evans childhood but also because i am aware not only through this news but from personal testimonies of some of my very own friends 
<clears throat> excuse me, some of my very own loved ones, relatives, that have experienced some of the same chaos that Dr. Evans described in his testimony. Some of my friends and distant relatives have even experienced some sexual abuse and some even death. But kingdom men, this is why it is so vitally important that you share this link. This lesson serves uh, as a help aid, as a point of encouragement. These series of lessons um, are designed to help and build up and encourage men, not just fathers, but men, to build them up that they may possibly hear, <coughs> excuse me, learn and understand the mandates of God and the mandate that God has on their lives, excuse me. devil trying to take my throat my throat away but he won't do it we've designed these lessons in this this class that men may be heroes and not zeros we're encouraging men to stand in the gap and to be the leader and father the trainer the teacher the provider the guardian that God has created them to be. It is a fact that we boys, that we as boys, uh, and, and as young men, we look for mentorship. We may not even verbalize it, but when we're young, we look to men as heroes. It's a fact that we train and we give e examples to younger men all around us, not just in our home, by the life that we live. We want the young men that we affect to grow up to be successful, productive, honorable, respectful, and loving gentlemen. The world teach young men that you need to be hard, vicious, a warrior. But the Bible even encourages us to be strong, but also to be gentle as a lamb. Notice I did not say anything about being famous, rich, or powerful. Because you don't need those attributes to gain favor with God. As a matter of fact, God warns more about those attributes, perhaps more than any other. Being famous, rich, or powerful is not a sin. That's not what I'm saying. But for the most part, not all, it makes it more difficult to be saved when you're famous, rich, and powerful. I didn't say you couldn't be saved. I said it makes it more difficult. Listen to the warning and the wisdom of God. In Proverbs 22 and verse 1, the King James Version, the Bible says, a good name. The New Living Translation says reputation. King James says, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And loving favor rather than silver or gold. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 through 12. The New Living Translation. Listen to what the Bible says. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith. And pierced themselves with many sorrows. You've taken your eyes off the cross and put your eyes on the mighty dollar and it's caused you great pain. Said the love of money. Didn't say money, but the love of money. 
It's caused you to turn away from your faith. Some you say, well, brother, Mark, I'm not rich. I don't yeah, but how much overtime do you ask for on Sundays when you should be at church? It's one thing to be mandated to do overtime. It's another when you ask for it. <laughs> Verse 11 says, but you, Timothy, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have confessed so well before many witnesses. In a nutshell, all Paul is encouraging this young preacher to do is to live a Christian life, a righteous life. Seek after righteousness, thirst and hunger for righteousness and not the mighty dollar. Some of our families have uh, been broken and torn and destroyed even because we neglect children for the mighty dollar. Now notice the ancient text as Jesus answers his disciples on who can be saved. Mark 10 verse 24, the B part. In verse 25, the King James says, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, it has been argued by some preachers who has read uh, some man's commentary that this term eye of the needle could have been referring to an ark over uh, a gate entrance to a city. But true old-fashioned word study reveals to us the word needle here uh, comes from the word rafes, and it comes from a primitive word uh, raftu, which means to sow. So he was being literal when he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. Now, again, he is not saying that rich being rich is a sin, but what he is saying that, that greater challenges come when you are rich. There's a greater challenge. And let me back up and address something earlier I said. Please don't get it twisted. When I said that some of us neglect our children for work again, I'm not talking about the fathers that are responsible, that has a true balance in their life. Yes, you may have a egregious job, a, a job that calls on you uh, for many hours, but if you make time for your children and you're providing for them, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about fathers who have said yes to their careers, yes to money, and no to their children and to their family. Brethren, I want to give you a final warning. As I see, our time is almost well spent. I want to give you a final warning on this term power. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8 and 9 in the New Living Translation. The Bible says, remember that the Lord will reward each one of us from the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. But watch what he says in verse 9. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. Let me give you a sidebar on this term slaves in verse 8. It comes from a word uh, which means bond. Uh, it's referring to being bound, bond or entrapped or uh, enslaved. Uh, doulos is the word. To be slave, a slave or enslaved. The term free there comes from the word eleutheros, which means not a slave or not restraint. What's the point here, Brother Miles? The point I'm trying to make to you is 
slavery was real in the Bible days. But don't get it twisted. And don't get all on this thing about, see there, this is a white man's book. No, it's not. Slavery was real. And Paul was speaking to the fact that there were some Christians who were enslaved. And what he speaks to in this particular context is that he's given a warning to the masters. This may be your present state, but you better be mindful how you treat those who are enslaved to you. Because both of you will face the same God. What are you talking about, Miles? I'm talking about power. We better be careful with the power that has been entrusted to us and how we treat others. How it allows us to treat others. In closing, Dr. Evans then gives a life-changing testimony. And if all had to do, and it all had to do, excuse me, with his father having a repentant heart and a desire to embrace the concept of a kingdom man. Dr. Evans states that his father changed his life and that his father's change of life and his decision to be the man of God that he was calling him to be, Dr. Evans confesses that it changed his life forever. Don't miss this. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. His father turned to Jesus. That's repentance. He got fired up about the Bible. That's transformation. He became an instant evangelist. Consumed with God's word. That's empowered with purpose. What are you saying, Miles, as I close? Listen, beloved, men of God, kingdom man. When we make the necessary changes in our life for the good and turn to God and become faithful men of God, it will help change the lives of those young men who are around us. They may not have come from your loin. They may be on your job. They may be at your local workout club. They may be at in your fraternity. They may be in your community. They may be even in your church. But when your life changes for the better, it can then change others. There must be repentance. Repentance is a change of heart. If you repent, God will take you through the, the, uh, the transformation. And then he will empower you with purpose. You got that? You have a change of heart and repent. God will take you through the transformation through his word. And then he will empower you with the purpose. What's the purpose? He says, go into all the world and teach every creature. Those who believe, baptize them. In other words, our job is to make disciples. Is to make others what God has made out of us. Dear brothers, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among the sanctified. Until next time, think on these things. Think on these principles. Share these principles. Share this online Bible study that others may be provoked and encouraged to be the men of God, the kingdom men that God is calling them to be. Until next time, I commend you to God in the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among the sanctified. God bless you and may he keep you is my prayer.